for this session and those who will be joining us later. Um, all this we pray and believe. Um, amen. Okay, as I said, uh, we have quite um, an insightful session part for you today. But I think before now we move on to the session itself, it would be good to get to know our host, uh, which is ShareHub. And just to give you a brief on what ShareHub um, is about, how ShareHub came, came to be. So ShareHub uh, as a concept was developed after a survey was done. And uh, it indicated that quite a significant percentage uh, about of um, 18 to 40 year olds were not investing. And uh, when an analysis was done of the survey results, uh, it was noted that there were two key barriers um, that were given for the reason of uh, this demographic not investing. The first one was um, the know-how in terms of understanding the capital markets and the products in the capital markets. Um, that was a barrier to people um, investing. And the second main one was on information, and information in terms of um, ease of accessing the information and even understanding this information to help you analyze uh, through your investment journey. So they're now looking at this. Um, ShareHub now came to be to provide this much needed know-how and uh, the information in a manner that was engaging, was easy to understand. And um, so we saw it fit to package it as an edu gaming, uh, you know, where you are learning, but also an engaging um, bit where you know, you're doing gaming as you're learning. So ShareHub as an app is based around quizzes and virtual games um, that are fun and uh, mirror stock market investing. So, you know, through it, you get a better understanding of uh, how the stock market works, uh, how the share price movements, the events that surround the stock market. And you also get to learn, learn the terminologies um, that you'll get to hear every other day as you're going through your investment journey. Because um, Shared's main aim is to change that mindset, you know, to get all of us as investors to be interested in uh, learning more about the stock market. And uh, we do it in a way that is fun and engaging. And also to provide a practical tool so that now as uh, potential investors, as new, you know, uh, new investors, we're also able to learn the um, investing strategies, the knowledge that, uh, that is needed when you're investing. And you can do this in a safe virtual environment. Um, and then now, you know, get you to transition on to real stock market investing when you're confident enough to, to start um, investing in the real stock market. So uh, our vision at ShareHub is um, to enable active and empowered investors to maximize their returns in the capital markets. And we are on a mission to provide informative and a safe platform for learning and trading in the capital markets. And, you know, and through this, um, connect people with real investing opportunities so that you're also able as an investor to fulfill your investment goals. So ShareHub is based on three pillars. Uh, we say for us, it's uh, to make it very engaging, simple, engaging, um, to better your understanding of um, what investing entails. The three pillars, um, we have play, we have learn, we have invest. On the play pillar, um, at ShareHub, we use gaming as an approach to get you to learn um, how to invest. And uh, we do this through the games. So we have um, the GPOs, the quizzes, which is more on, um, answering questions. And you get to familiarize yourself with terminologies um, that you will encounter every other day as you're going through your investment journey. We have um, the Wazito game, which is a stock market simulated game in a virtual environment, safe and easy for you to play. And through the play, you're also able to learn strategies that now you can be able to use um, when you start real market investing. And then we have the stock market, the Stock Street game as well. Uh, stock Street is actually based on um, the companies that make up the NSC 20 share index. So, you know, we are transitioning you slowly, start by understanding the terminologies through our quizzes, the Jacuzzi quizzes, and then you have a fully um, virtual game where, you know, you have virtual companies in a virtual environment and you try out strategies um, that you'll be able to employ when you're investing and then, you know, um, transition you then to the Stock Street game. Stock Street game is based on companies that are actually listed on the Nairobi Securities Exchange. 
and you're able now to get yourself familiarized with companies that are listed um, at the Kenyan stock market, but still in a virtual environment. So, you know, you're now able to try out this, um, you know, investing strategies um, slowly. But then as you're doing that, you're also getting to understand the events that go around in the real stock market and how they affect the companies that are listed. Because you can see that when you're playing um, the stock street game. Um, so that's the first pillar. That's the play pillar. And then on the LAN pillar, um, where we're giving you real-time information and news to help support your investing decisions. Because for us, we believe in making informed investment decisions. And we do this, um, you have um, market news. Market news gives you information on what is currently happening in the market. So you're always on the know. From the app, you're able to access all uh, financial news wherever you want. And then we also have market information. This is uh, access to data that dates back up to 10 years um, for you to be able now to uh, use when you're making your analysis and trying to make your investment decisions in um, the real stock market. On the land pillars, well, we do a lot uh, in terms of financial literacy, um, very, very strong for us. Um, for, and this is part of um, what we look at as a financial literacy. We also do a lot of... Um, financial literacy trainings with uh, universities. I think if you follow us on social media, you will see we've had quite a, a number of engagements and you know we have more coming up just to be able to get um, our youth to be financially literate and start thinking about the investment journey young yeah? because um, better ben greater benefits um, await them when they start this investment journey young. Yeah? So when we take you through the play and, you know, you get to enjoy playing the games and getting to learn a few strategies, trying them out in the virtual environment, you know, which is risk free and safe for you to do that. And we've empowered you with the information that you need in terms of um, any data that you require to help you make informed decisions. And then now the invest option is where now, you know, we transition you where now you can actually use the information, the skills and the experience that you have gained from playing and from um, the, the land, you know, the market information and the market news. And you're able now to use that when you start out your investing journey in um, investing in the real uh, stock market. So those are the three main pillars um, that make up ShareHub. And as I said, for us, we are very strong on um, financial literacy and one of the ways is through the webinars. So we've had quite a number of webinars um, as you can see, we had uh, we started off with an introduction to the stock market uh, purely for beginners, getting them to understand simplified way of what the stock market is, how to start. Um, we then we went on to talk about how do you build your portfolio, how do you manage it. Um, we've had a webinar where we talked about the stock buying strategy, um, how to get you buying right. And then we also had one where, you know, as an investor, you have to be able to understand um, the key financial statements, you know, listed companies will um, announce their results when you're looking at that. You know, you don't think of them as just numbers. So uh, key pointers on what to look out for and what those numbers mean. Um, and then we also had our latest one was on the power of dividends, um, where we took you through understanding dividend stocks and just dividends on how to be able to capitalize and, and make your dividends um, compound um, for you. So all of this, um, if you're looking and you're thinking, I missed all this, well, <laughs> um, it is okay. They're all available on our YouTube channel. Um, you, if you, you know, share Hub Kenya, um, subscribe, you can be able to go through them. I'll also share our contacts. Um, you can be able to reach out in case maybe you've seen something and you'd want to engage us more. Uh, we're always open. At the end, I'll share our contacts. But this is some, so um, this today's webinar is actually a build up to this because when we have these um, webinars, we normally have um, polls and surveys um, and today as well. So please um, just a note to our participants, our attendees, um, we have, we'll have have ongoing uh, poll and, um, and surveys. So kindly, kindly um, do participate because it is through um, your uh, responses to the polls and the surveys that we are able now to pick out um, issues that we can be able now to curate uh, a better webinar tailored to what, um, what you have shared with us uh, in the surveys and the polls. So as they come along, please um, do, um, do participate in them. 
um, so that now we can make uh, the future webinars better and you know, uh, based on the information that you share with us. So as I said, the webinars that we've had before are available on our YouTube channel. Um, you can also check us out on all the other social media platforms. We are active on all of them. And you're welcome to engage us in that. Um, we're also very big on financial literacy trainings um, in universities, especially going out and sharing with the future generation, uh, the, the generation for now, um, to get them to understand not just what is investing, but you know, get them to understand key financial concepts or you know skills that they should be able to start employing now that can be able to make their, their future better. Um, and all that. So, um, as I said, for us at ShareHub, we are very keen on uh, providing you with the information, uh, the experience, and the skills through the games um, that we have and through our webinars, through our financial literacy trainings. Mm -hmm. And uh, from your end, which is the time, like now uh, you're here with us. For, for this webinar to be able now to gain that information because um, when we work together, then we're able to balance it out and get you um, investing successfully in the stock market, which um, is our end goal at, here at ShareHub. Now, um, I know most of you had seen the poster and um, at this point, I was to invite uh, the CEO because when we started looking at what to discuss for this webinar, we were like, as everyone is transitioning on to start investing um, in the real stock market, you would have to engage the services of a broker. So part of the feedback that we got from people is, um, okay, so now I need to engage a broker, but I want to understand more on what role this broker that I'm engaging um, is. What role do they play in my investing journey? So that you know, from uh, my end as an investor, I understand and I'm able to engage them in the right capacity. And um, so we thought, let's seek out collaboration. Um, and we went ahead and uh, spoke to um, CASIB. CASIB is um, Kenya's Association of Stockholders and Investment Banks. And uh, today we want to have opening remarks by the CEO of CASIP, uh, William Joroge. But um, unfortunately, because of um, unforeseen circumstances, he was not able to join. Um, he does send his apologies, and um, but he says we he's well presented because with us we have um, two um, members of um, CASIP who will be joining us and taking us through the session and sharing the experience and the expertise uh, being in the Kenyan stock market over the years. And um, look forward to to this. So um, I share the apologies of uh, William Joroge. He wanted to be with us today, but he won't be able to um, attend. And um, so we, but he's well presented by the the members, the casting members who are here um, from Sterling Capital and NCB Investment Bank. Um, so the, <laughs> I, I think I take this opportunity to just share the bio of our presenters today. Um, so first I'll start off with uh, Samuel Gishogi. He's uh, one of our speakers. Samuel is the head of business development in the brokerage unit at our NCBA Investment Bank. So he previously served as the business development manager and a senior research analyst at NIC Securities Limited. Samuel is passionate about financial inclusion, market digitization, and investor education. So he's joined us today. He's going to share um, his experience and his expertise um, on uh, the role of stockbrokers uh, in, uh, when you're investing. Um, our second speaker for today is Mary Wamboi. Uh, Mary Wamboi is the head of operations at Sterling Capital Limited. She's in charge of back office operation and has about 10 years experience in brokerage operations. So we are in safe hands. Uh, she has developed solid relationships with both institutional and limited clients. She has been involved in development and establishing procedures for new products for retail clients um, in the market. And as I said, you know, today we're going to have a very insightful session. And um, I, I welcome both, uh, both our speakers and uh, stay tuned. So those are contacts, um, but I think at this point, um, let me welcome our first speaker to just take us through the session and help us understand. Um, so who are stock brokers? <laughs> uh, as you know, uh, as as investors, as new investors, as seasoned investors, you know, we can always learn something. So Karibu sana, Mary. 
um, share with us on uh, who stock brokers are. Thank you so much, Linda, for your introduction. And also we appreciate what you've been doing with investors and educating the market. Uh, there has been a gap and you guys are doing a good job. Um, as part of the Kenya Association of Stock Brokers, we are happy to join you and just to continue in this journey of educating our investors. So without further ado, I'm going to take you through um, just to introduce who are stockbrokers and to help uh, investors understand why do we need stockbrokers in the market? Um, because a lot of people uh, don't usually understand why you have to go through a stockbroker. So it is really important as also we try to understand how to navigate through investing and the stock market uh, also to just help you understand the role that they play in the market today. So I'm going to share a presentation. So as we try to understand the role of stockbrokers in the stock market, it is important first we understand who are they and, and what do they do and do we need them in the market. Um, the stockbrokers are the link between the investors and the stock market. Um, I, I keep saying you cannot walk to the stock market and go to the floor and say, I have come to buy, uh, uh, to buy shares, to buy a fixed income um, security. Uh, you have to go through a market intermediary who comes in between the issuer. The issuers, for instance, we have Safaricom. Safaricom, they they want to list their 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 shares uh, to be accessible to the public, and they want to list it through the stock exchange. So, how does an investor go and buy, uh, uh, become part of a, a shareholder or become part of an owner of of the shares? You have to go through a market intermediary, and that is where stockbrokers and investors bank they come in so they play the role of facilitating the buying and the selling of the stocks uh, through the stock market you would have a perfect market when you have a buyer and a seller and someone who's bringing them together and this is where stock brokers come in you come you open an account through a stock broker um, again uh, you don't go to the issuer and tell them I want to become a shareholder if those securities are listed at the stock exchange. For other companies, it is possible because uh, other companies manage their, their, their investors differently. But for those companies that are listed at the, uh, at the, let me say, Nairobi Stock Exchange or other stock exchanges, then you have to go through a market intermediary and that is a stockbroker or an investment bank. Now, uh, what do we refer to when we say a stockbroker is licensed? Do they need to be licensed? Do you need to go through a licensed stockbroker to be able to buy securities in the stock market? And the answer is yes. A licensed stockbroker um, has to attain certain credentials or to be authorized, have to get certain authorization by the regulating authority in that particular market to be able to buy and sell securities on your behalf. So as you go to the market and as you, you, you learn how to invest and you want to become a shareholder of different uh, companies or invest in different uh, classes of assets and different sectors, then you, you, you need to go through a license stock broker and you also need to understand that as an investor yes you are protected so in kenya all stock brokers or anybody who's carrying out the business of a stock broker has to be licensed by the capital markets authority and as in an investor you you can do your due diligence you can go through the capital markets uh, authority website and just look at who are the licensed stock brokers and and what uh, and who who they are now, um, it is part of building confidence in an investor, knowing that there is an authority that oversees the, 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 the business that is carried out by a stockbroker, so that the, you, you're able to be confident as an investor to know that your investments are protected. Reason being, for us as uh, stockbrokers or investment banks, uh, we have 
to uh, we have to apply certain set principles and do best practice that has already been laid out by the Capital Markets Authority. And also for us to make sure that we keep being licensed because um, these licenses, they can be revoked and they are revoked when uh, um, um, the authority uh, is not confident or we are not uh, keeping the interests of the clients first. So as an investor, um, the benefit of going through a licensed stockbroker or just knowing that your stockbroker is licensed is to just give you confidence that your interests are adequately protected by the authority and the person um, and the institution that you're using as your broker has the prerequisite or has what is required as a best practice in the industry to be your stockbroker. Now, uh, some of the benefits of uh, going through a stock broker when you're going uh, doing your investment journey is that they have the expertise and they have the knowledge. Yeah, you know, for you as an investor, if you, you know, you, you uh, we have different investors in the market and there are, there are those investors who are knowledgeable. There are those investors who do not have or do not take the time to, you know, uh, go through all the sectors in the market or to under, to have the insights and all that. So your invest, uh, your, your stockbroker or your investment bank comes in and they give you the benefit of having the expertise and the knowledge. They have been in the market for so long. They have the, the insights, they have the analysis, Analysis. They can look at, uh, we are, for us, we are able to look at our different investors and we can tell their risk tolerance, what is the, what are your goals as an investor? Because maybe for me as Mary, my investment goals are different from Linda's investment goals. And based on our experience and our expertise and knowledge in the market, we're able to categorize our clients and we're able to guide you to be able to know um, what are the recommended um, sectors you can invest in what are the recommended asset classes that you can uh, you can invest in and and that is very beneficial for you as an investor now another benefit is uh, we have access to different types of markets um, we are able to to know because this is our every everyday life so we know what is happening in in the market we can be able to predict you know we can be able to give you insights as an investor um, as a stock broker Another benefit is we guide you through your investments and we're able to give you advice. Uh, when I look at you and I see you're, you're a risk averse investor, I'm able to guide you on what, where would you invest in? What do you need to invest in? And how can you plan your investment goals? Um, we also do, most of the stockbrokers do research and analysis. Uh, we look at different sectors. Like for us, we are able to do different sectors. We have the banking reports. We, ha we, we have the... Um the fixed income reports we have uh, we can look at the market in general and these research reports are published uh, they are free and they are published they are published very often we also have daily reports that we do on the market how 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 was the market today we're able to guide you and to just give you an analysis as stock brokers uh, just what has been happening today which um which which stock stock uh, is, has been you know which stock uh, has been is performing well today how did the market open or what are the opportunities that you would have been able to invest in today we're also able to look at uh, weekly uh, we, we do weekly reports also um monthly reports you know periodical reports um for us in our market we usually see our market can be affected by different things in the market different environments um uh, the changes in the re exchange rate the political environment the global market so we, ha we we are able now to guide you and to know where is our market headed and uh, as an investor this is very crucial for you so that you're not making um, and informed decisions when you're getting into an investment, and those are some of the, the those are some of the benefits of uh, having a, a stock broker, and just having a relationship with a stock broker in your investment journey. They're not limited to that. There are also there are also more benefits. 
Now, I know some people have seen uh, stockbrokers and investment, and you know, you wonder is there a difference between a stockbroker and an investment bank? So, I mean, a stockbroker, their primary focus is usually on execution of trades, managing portfolio, and you know, advisory, and giving you advice on you know where to invest in, and they, they help you to manage your portfolio. They are the link between uh, you and the market, and they, they help you to place orders uh, in the market for for the listed securities. Now, for the investment banks they have more financial services that they offer and that they are licensed to do. They have, you know, the, there is the corporate advisory. They, are, they, they help in advising um, uh, corporates on mergers and takeovers, uh, investment opportunities. Uh, the list is endless. And these are uh, some of the financial services that investment banks they do. Now, one thing that you need to understand is that investment banks are non-deposit taking institutions. Um, we have the commercial banks where you deposit your money and you keep your money in a bank. Now, with investment banks, you deposit your money with an intention of an investment. So we are non-deposit taking institution, and that is very crucial for an investor to understand. Uh, you know, you, some people hear investment bank because you hear the name bank. You, you, you know, some investors think it is a bank where you put in your money and then you come and withdraw. Uh, if you put in your money in an investment bank, um, or even a stockbroker, you put in your money and you don't do anything with it. By that, when you go to withdraw it, you know you'll you'll be asked a few questions because somebody would want to understand why did you put a deposit and you did not make any investment. So, the the when you're putting your money in an investment bank, it is usually with a specific reason. Now, on top of all that, an investment bank is also licensed. Uh, to engage in the business of a stockbroker. But if a stockbroker is not licensed as an investment bank, then they are not able to offer these, these other uh, financial services that we have listed there. Um, maybe I could just um, take you through who is Sterling Capital. So for us at Sterling Capital, we are licensed as an investment bank. Uh, so we also carry out the business of uh, stock brokerage. Um, we are a trading participant at the Nairobi Securities Exchange. Uh, we do uh, equities trading, fixed income trading. This is fixed income is bonds. So we have the listed the listed bonds. We also facilitate in investing in uh, treasury bills. Um, when you come to us, we're able to advise you on this. We we'll also participate in uh, derivatives trading, which is has been new in the market. And, you know, maybe when sometime we will guide the clients through, um, we'll guide you through what, um, what is the difference between equities and fixed income and derivatives. Um, but maybe that would be for another time. Um, we have a uh, different clientele. Uh, we, we have uh, so many retail individuals. We have we also serve foreign uh, fund managers and local fund managers. And our clients are a whole, you know, the, we have different categories of clients that we, we are able to offer our services to. Um, Selling Capital has been awarded the best in fixed income broker for we were the leading fixed income broker for 2019, 2020, and 2021. Um, so you, we are able to offer you um, advisory on fixed income and also to trade for you. We've also been recognized as best investment bank for, from the year 2020 to 2022. Um, listed there, we also have other services that we offer. I've already mentioned we facilitate equities trading. Now, equities trading, I know Linda has taken you through uh, what equities is in the past uh, webinars, but equities is, is the stocks. Um, you know, like Safaricom, Equity, Equity Bank, KCB, these are the, the stocks. This is what we call the stocks. Now, we, we are able to facilitate uh, buying and selling of equities, also in fixed income. 
we're able to help you to invest uh, derivative trading we also have other products uh, for lending we have margin trading which is also uh, something in very interesting in the market where you if you have you, you hold shares in your account and you want to take advantage of a market opportunity you don't need to and you don't have the money uh, at that instance we are able to allow you to trade um it's like giving you a loan to trade but it is based on your the portfolio that you hold then we also have loan against shares where uh, if you hold um uh, Certain securities, we are able to give you a loan based on that. You use that as your security, no need for guarantors or anything. Quick loan, you take a loan against your share. So you can see as an investor, if you are investing in uh, in the stock market and you, know, you can be able to get an opportunity where you can borrow against your investments. We also offer research analysis. Um, if you check through our website and like i mentioned a lot of brokers are able to offer you research analysis and this is very important for an investor if you are going to the market to invest you have to make sure that you go through the research analysis that are provided by your stock brokers for, to help you to make a very informed decision uh, you need to know where is the market heading you need to know how has a company been performing uh, and all this is offered in research analysis that are provided by brokers and the investment banks. Uh, last but not the least, we also offer real estate ad investments advisory. This is uh, rates, which is also, it has been there in the market and now it's beginning to pick up. Um, so we'll see more of that. Um, thank you. I'll give the, 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 I'll give the meeting back to Linda. Oh, wow. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I think for me, like key things, and I always say, um, whether you're a new investor, you're a seasoned investor, um, through webinars like this, there's always something you can pick up um, and, and learn, you know, something new that you can learn. Uh, so for me, I think the key, the key things I've um, picked from Mary's presentation is one, uh, deal with licensed brokers. And I think even here at ShareHub, we are always insisting as you start your investing journey, uh, please make sure you're dealing with licensed investors. And Mary did share, you know, you can get the list of licensed um, brokers from um, the CMA website, the NSE website, and it has all their contacts um, here at ShareHub as well. We've shared the list of um, the licensed brokers, um, you know, you can be able to get. And so, you know, when you're dealing, you're dealing with people who have been vetted and um, you know they've been given the go-ahead um, to be able to give you the investment um, advice and help you through your investment uh, investment journey. And uh, it's good. Thank you, really, uh, especially that one for investment banks and brokers. I know it's a question most guys are always looking and thinking, you know, like um, for Sterling and even for NCBA, you know, you're talking about um, Sterling Investment Bank. NCB investment back and then now you're taking brokers so at, at times you know especially for the new um, investors they always you always get a bit of confusion so thank you very much for clarifying that and also for sharing that the fact that um, you're investing in, in, in equity you know um, stock investing is beyond just passive income through dividends you know the fact that you can be able to borrow um, against your portfolio um, when in a tough uh, financial situation is also very key um, for investors to know. So these are added benefits um, to, to investors when you when you look when you look at uh, investing now in the in the stock market. Um, so then I think I I take this opportunity. You know, Mary's taken us through getting us to understand uh, brokers who are stock brokers. Uh, so I give this opportunity to um, Gishoi. Uh, to take us through. So, you know, we know who brokers are, but then, so what are their key functions so that we know how best to utilize them? So, Kishoi, Karibu Sama. Uh, thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. And, uh, wow, great presentation, Mary. And uh, I was sitting here feeling nice to be a broker. So, I'm going to uh, discuss the key functions of brokers. My name is Samuel Gishohi. I work with NCBA Investment Bank. We are an investment bank. We are also a stockbroker. And so I'm just going to take you through the key functions of brokers, what we do. Um, uh, Mary has explained a lot of them um, as, as she went through the presentation. So I'm just going to emphasize on some of the areas that maybe 
you would get some insights on what we do. Now, brokerage is actually, as we know, the business of giving you access uh, to a market where you can buy and sell uh, listed securities on the market. And so basically, we are the one who sit between you and the market. You, It's actually part of regulation that if you want to trade on a market, you need to go through a broker. But um, a broker also gives you access to a lot of other services that um, I'm going to highlight here. Now, if you look at the stockholders of the, the industry um, and where the stock brokers operate, then you will note that there are several stakeholders. Uh, of course, the regulators, the Capital Markets Authority. Um, then we have the trading platform, which is now electronic. In the past, we used to stand in a room and wear red jackets and shout numbers, but today it is digitized. So there's a platform called the Automated Trading System that is run by the Nairobi Securities, uh, Securities Exchange. Then there's where the shares actually sit. So the exchange is where the trading is happening. The shares sit in the Central Depository and Settlement Corporation. So that's just a database where the shares happen and the settlement. When you buy a share, that is where they change hands. And then there's the shares registrars um, like CNR. And these registrars, their job is usually to keep a register of all the shares that of a company. So um, if you look at the situation where you've just bought some shares uh, at CDS and they're in CDSC and uh, you bought them from somebody, uh, that company has announced a dividend. At the point of the payment of the dividend, the registrar will pick that database from CDSC or sometimes request you to update your details with the registrar and then they're able to pay you the dividend. So you see they are um, a key function within the whole uh, the whole environment. And then, of course, we have you, the shareholders and investors. But the key thing is that the stockbroker is the face of this whole environment. This whole um, um, environment is actually um, where if you want to deal with the, the share registrar, for example, a lot of the time, if you're doing things like transmission, somebody has passed on, those shares need to change hands. You're doing, you're transferring shares. You have changed your address. You have moved to a new house. You need to change those details. Now, it means that you would need to see the stockbroker. The stockbroker would help you to fill whatever forms you need to fill. And then they would submit them either to CDSC or to the registrars. If you want to buy shares, you'd come to the stockbroker. And the stockbroker is the one who would facilitate you to access the market. Um, so basically, the stockbroker is the face of the industry, is the one that you see, the one you interact with when you want to do anything um, investing, buying, selling shares, or even maintaining your, your data within the market. So I'm just going to look at uh, the actual um, areas, um, you know, one by one. And I think uh, Mary has already discussed them, so I won't really belabor the points. Um, so, of course, yeah, buying and selling and IPOs, initial public off offers, which is what when a company is initially coming to the market. And this means that when you're buying shares and it's a company coming initially to the market, the stockbroker is the, the placing agent because there will be the people who structured the deal, which is probably an advisory team, um, an investment bank for that matter. There will be legal issues and everything. Now, the company sells the shares to the public in the initial public offer. That selling of the shares in the initial public offer is done through the stockbroker. So it is the stockbroker who will open your account, is the stockbroker who will give you an who will get your CDSC account, and it's the stockbroker who will now assist you to apply for those shares. Of course, that also um, comes in if you're doing um, rights issues, for example, which is when a company is issuing additional shares to existing shareholders at a discount. Um, now, as you also had, a, a, a stockbroker, it's not a necessity. It is not something a stockbroker has to do, but an addition of value by most stockbrokers. And this is a key area when you're selecting a stockbroker is the research and investment advice. How accessible is the research? How well done is it? What kind of research team do they have? And uh, what kind of reports they're giving you? Because this is the information. Remember, um, value value is king, but information is the key. So um, you may know about shares, but the information you have, because markets move because of information. 
uh, for market to be efficient, you need to get information of what is happening on time, of what is happening in the market, you know, um, at the same time so that you all make the right decisions. So that is another area that stock workers will be supporting you. Another function, of course, as I said earlier, is opening um, CDSC accounts and, and also, and this is where the, the initial contact with the market will usually happen. And that also goes into maintaining of your particulars at CDSC. Remember, uh, the, the particulars you have at CDSC are the same particulars, for example, that a registrar is going to use when they're paying a dividend. Because um, there are three key things that happen when a company announces their profit. The first one is they make the announcement, of course. The second one is there's a day that they close their books, meaning that between the announcement and the book's closure, if you buy that share, you're going to get the dividend. So if you buy that share on the day they close the books, how are you going to get the dividend? After the book's closure and between that and the payment date, um, which is the third major announcement, this, the information at CDSC will be passed on to the registrar so that they're able to tell who actually owns the shares at what point and who deserves to be paid a dividend. Um, there are other things like immobilization of share certificates. Um, if you already have, if you have share certificates in this time and age, you cannot trade your shares. And so you need to have those shares in what we call a, a, a digital format. And the digital format is what sits at the Central Depository and Settlement Corporation. That's where the shares sit. So if you have share certificates, you need to come and immobilize them. And that's what the broker does. We are the ones who take those shares, uh, you fill some form, you surrender the certificates, and we send those shares, those certificates to the central depository. And then now they will sit in an electronic state so that you are able to buy and sell those shares. And this helps a lot. Um, this information is important because I know many of you, you might be the younger ones and you've not done share certificates. But if you look around, you have grandmothers, uncles, and aunties who may be holding certificates. And it is very important that you start to get them to immobilize them so that at any point, if they need even to transfer these shares to their, their beneficiaries, it is a very easy and simple process. Um, one of the things Mary uh, mentioned was pledging and, and pledging of securities. Now, sometimes when you hold shares or you hold bonds, um, you want to take a loan against this securities. And so for you to take uh, a loan against a security, it needs to be um, pledged as in it needs to be used as collateral. It means during the time you're holding that loan, you cannot sell that security because it is a collateral for a loan. That is another function of brokers. And so um, if you're looking to borrow against your shares, and remember, if they're in share certificates, you cannot pledge them. So you also have to immobilize them. We also handle things like transmissions and private transfers. Um, if a person passes on, um, whether it is instead interstate or not, as in they had a will or they did not have a will, um, those shares shares are like the same mashamba we go and and divide when somebody passes on. So um, that is a function of stockbrokers. We are the ones you will come to, and then we will uh, open accounts for these beneficiaries. We will assist with the process of uh, making sure the documentation that you need um, to be able to transfer those shares to the beneficiaries is all right, and you can do that. Another thing you can actually do is transfer shares to somebody um, whom you're related to, but there has to be proof, to be proof of relation. So it can be a, a son or a daughter, you know, probably a parent, but there has to be proof that like a birth certificate or a marriage certificate that the person you're transferring to is actually a relative, but that is another function that stockbrokers do. Um, one of the things that um, has happened in time, and you have noticed me mention the digital side of things repeatedly, is that today uh, you can actually be able to trade you, yourself. You don't need to actually, in the past, you would walk into the stockbroker's office they would have a register, of course, before computers, they would probably have a big book that you're their client, and then you'd give them some certificates, and it would take maybe a few weeks before you got new certificates that you now owned shares. Of course, that makes a market very inefficient. Um, today, as I said, um, we, we trade shares in an electronic form, and because now 
we have a database we do have a stock brokers systems that allow you to access your account from wherever you are whether it is on your phone whether it is on your computer so another function that stock brokers do is to avail these platforms to you to avail the information you need to trade so that you can be able to log in and see your account, see your statements. You can be able to see Nairobi Securities Exchange live. And that is a key function that in today's world you would need because then uh, remember I said that information moves market. It means that if something happens and you're watching the news and you see something that you feel may affect the share that you have, you don't need to send me an email or take a bus to come and tell me to buy or sell your shares, you can actually log into your platform and be able to do that. Some of these platforms um, also allow you to place markets off market. So you can actually log in even now, see what the price was. Maybe you're too busy tomorrow. You can place the order. And when the market opens, your order is going to be picked up. So um, access to information is a key function of a market is a key thing for any investor in a market. And so one of the basics of selecting a broker or looking for somebody who can give you the best services is one, the information sharing. Um, you know, today we even have channels where you can just log in and see our research reports. We have websites, as Mary mentioned, we have so many places you can see this different information. That is a very important thing. Um, the other accessibility to your stockbroker themselves, being able to call and discuss with your, your stockbroker is a very important thing. Today in our market, we're also seeing stockbrokers um, availing chatbots, um, which allow them to be able to communicate even with more people. So, and also webinars like this are other avenues that we come to try and get the information out there to you, to educate you so that you can make informed investment decisions. Um, that's about it. Of course, I'm sure there will be questions as we go in the panel about what other functions we might offer. Um, and we will be very happy to answer those. Um, as I said, I work for NCBA Investment Bank. We are an investment bank, which means we do brokerage, um, which I've just explained. We also do wealth management, which means we do unit trusts, which are for those who are looking for passive investments, um, fixed income fund, which in some places is called a money market fund, we have uh, an equity fund, dollar funds, et cetera. Um, and we also have an advisory or corporate finance department. These are the ones who advise companies if they're doing IPOs and that kind of thing. And so you can see as a brokerage, we also feed from them as the placing agent when they have uh, they do transactions like that. Um, I'm going to stop there and, and I'm thankful that I've had this opportunity to talk to you. But I think the key thing to walk out of uh, from this forum is that um, don't sit out there and worry about where you're going to learn and understand investment. You can walk into any broker, you can call us, and I'm sure you will get our contacts. Um, it is our job to advise you. And uh, I have had people say, oh, you're just talking to other people because they have a lot of money. I always tell people, hakuna pesandogo. It is not how much you have, it's what you do with the little you have. Thank you very much, and I'm going to hand over to Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Kishoi, for, for that. And uh, yes, uh, it is true. Uh, it's one of the things where we are told about brokers, like, oh, no, 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 their research, they only share with the ones who have a lot of money and all that. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, so for me, it's, you know, both Mary and Kishoi have talked about um, the kind of information that brokers provide to investors, whether you are a new investor, you are a seasoned investor, please make use of them because then that is the only time you're able to make informed investment decisions. Um, and, and this they share, uh, I think even Mary and Shoei have said, these are usually on the broker's website. So if you go, you'll be able to access um, that information, you know, reach out to them, talk to them. Um, try and see if, if there's any news that has come out, any um, company that is listed that has announced 
and uh, you want to have a brief discussion, reach out to them, you know, talk to them. Uh, and again, thank you, Bishoi, for talking on digitization, because that, I think, has been a very main handle for, for people. When people used to think, yes, I want to start investing, but then that means now I have to go through the whole manual process of going, filling, but with, and, and you know, now having to call my broker every time I want to buy or sell uh, shares and send this kind. So digitization has made it easy for all of us, whether we are... Um, you know, new investors, uh, whether veteran investors. So, you know, you are able to do it from uh, from wherever you are. So please, if you've not started investing, I would um, recommend that you do. And um, I think, yeah, for me, it's just um, maybe now I think we will head to the panel panel discussion. And we'll head to the panel discussion. And uh, we had said for this panel discussion, we want to look at um, what is going on in our market now. You know, um, is, uh, the market is facing a downturn. We have investors uh, you know, who already invested. Um, you know, it's some of them in a panic mode and, and all that. But we want today to look at is, um, on an, is there an upside to uh, an, the down market that we are currently facing? And I think maybe I just start off for the ones, you know, for the benefit of the ones who um, don't really know when you say a bear market, a down market, um, by defining what a bear market is. So a bear market is defined as a prolonged period uh, where there's a decline in stock prices. And uh, it's usually said when we see um, stock prices are declining by about 20% or more. Um, which is what we've seen even in our Kenyan market here. And so maybe I just direct this to Mary, um, if you can help us understand what are the key indicators uh, that signal a bear market so that as investors, you know, we can be able to be on the lookout and uh, recognize them as we go about our investing journey. Thank you, Linda. Um... So Linda has said uh, when we have a bear market is when we have, I'd say in simple terms, a downward market. And when we have a bull market is an upward market. Um, so this is when um, a bull market is when you have uh, the stock prices are moving up, the asset, the, the asset prices are moving up, or we are expecting because of the different environments either uh, global or whatever economical or whatever the situation is, we're expecting to have an upward market in maybe say a month, uh, next couple of quarters or in an year or so. Uh, when we have a bear market, the market is going, everything is going down. And I think this is what we are currently uh, going through. Uh, we had COVID and then prices dropped for a bit. This is now the Nairobi Securities Exchange. Um, for a couple of months there, we had an, an upward movement of prices. And then over and over again, the prices have just been dropping. So how do you know we are having a bear market? As the indicators are, in general, not just one uh, security. You, when you look across all the sectors, all the prices are going down. And this is what we are currently in. So it's it's not secluded to one particular company where you're seeing the price of that particular company has gone down. Uh, we're not looking at one specific uh, sector. We're looking at all the sectors in the market are going down. And maybe just, I don't know, to explain uh, the sector, when we say sector, we have different sectors in the market. So we have the manufacturing, we have the, the we have the services, we have the banking sector. So I think on the Nairobi Securities Exchange, there is usually they are able to offer a price list, and it has all the different sectors that are there in our market and the different companies and where they fall under. For instance, Safaricom it falls under telecommunication. Um, so when you look at the market, one sector is not the only one that is performing badly. So the prices have been going down across the board. So that is one of the indicators. The other indicator is when you're seeing um, uh, economically, all the indicators are weakening. Uh, what is the condition of our 
economy so everything is not looking up or even uh when you talk to different people when you look at different analyses the different uh, like we said uh, we have different stockbrokers and they do analyses and they do uh, different research reports when you compare and you you look at all those uh, analyses of the economy and how it is doing everything is just you know going down um that is another indicator I would say an economic indicator now another indicator is you look at the corporate earnings uh, of different companies and they are also significantly declining you look at the the corporate earning of one security uh, or, or rather one company that is listed at the exchange you look at another when they release their results you look at another corporate earning all of them over time, maybe in one quarter, you have like um, banking sector when they are releasing their results. They usually release their results around the same, you know, not the same time, but around the same period. When you look at um, an analysis of how they are giving their uh, earnings and maybe earnings per share, all of them you'd notice maybe they are uh, you know, or most of them, they have significantly declined. Then we would say, we are having a bear market. So it is not restricted to one security. It is not restricted to one sector. It is just in general, the, 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 the market in general. You also have um, another indicator, though I wouldn't say this is, um, I'd say this is, a, you would have to combine this. It, it is a sentimental thing. So uh, with sentiment and the different people in the market, when you talk to them, when you talk to your stockbroker, you talk to different people. And, uh, you know, when you're watching the news and seeing the comments on, you know, everybody is feeling, they are feeling, I, I say it's a sentiment because it is a feeling. Everybody is feeling um, the market may drop in the next couple of months, uh, generally, not not specifically to one sector. So those are some of the indicators. And I think uh, being a bear market uh, is, is everything down. And like I said, not, restric not restricted to one specific factor. Over to you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, uh, for at least helping us to understand so that now we are able to recognize uh, when we're in a bear market. Um, so maybe just to show you again, uh, now that we recognize we're in a bear market, are there any advantages that, you know, as investors, um, we can uh, look to be able to benefit from uh, this bear market? You know, we are hoping it's not all gloom, uh, just prices declining and everything. Uh, is there some light somewhere for us as investors in the bear market, especially if you are thinking long term? Uh, thank you, Linda. Um, I, I think uh, I was just thinking um, how I used to remember what a bear market and a bull market is when I was younger is that bears attack down. A bear slaps you like that. So that's down. Bulls, they attack upwards. So the market is going up. So just in case you're wondering, you know, even in accounts, you used to wonder the debit, credit. That's how you remember. Anyway, um, the market is the pulse of an economy. That is very true, as Mary has said. And, um, and in as much as we are in unprecedented times, and I think it's important to mention this, because um, for those of you who are a bit more aware about how markets work, um, usually uh, you would expect that... Uh, when we are in a bear market, then uh, bond valuations are also high. But unfortunately, this is one of the few times in history, even in my time in a market, that both of these are, is, are happening at the same time. Um, but we have seen now interest rates going up, which means a lot of people are more interested in bonds and most people are talking about bonds. But then um, the interesting thing is how these two things pull against each other. Because when we are in, the, in a bear market, then there's a tendency for interest rates to go up, and we have seen that happening. So there's something called flight of capital. People feel, then let me put my money in bonds, which are making me a high, higher interest rate. But the contrarian or the other thing that is happening at the same time is that these shares that are going down, if you look at their... For example, we are still seeing a lot of corporates, um, which again is unprecedented. We're still seeing, for example, the banking sector still making double-digit profits. Um, 
primarily because interest rates are high and they're getting a lot of interest, of course, from the bonds they're selling to governments, and the banking sector is still doing quite well. Now, if that is the case, then it means that fundamentally, the companies that we are seeing with low price prices at the moment are actually undervalued. And that means that if tomorrow the reasons, the external factors that are causing these shares to be down, and maybe for a moment I can mention why this has happened. Um, 70% of our market is actually, uh, under normal circumstances, is actually controlled by foreign investor buying. Now, foreign investors will usually look for companies with big tickets where they can buy a big chunk of shares because they're coming in with dollars. But because of the high inflation rates we have been having, then what has happened is the dollar has started to increase in value against the shilling. And so foreign in, and the countries out there like the U.S. have started increasing interest rates. And so investors who are sitting who are sitting on 70 percent of our shares feel that if the shilling has lost value to the dollar, then the assets they're holding in shillings are losing value. So what do they do? They sell those shares so that they take their dollars out and investment, the investor is invest them in their local markets. That has continuously pushed our market down. Uh, an example is one of the biggest stocks in our market. By the beginning of this whole period after the Ukraine war started and the inflationary issues happened, as the invest, investor, foreign investors in, say, Safaricom, at the beginning of this was about 70%. This is the float, forget Vodacom. By about two, three weeks ago, when I last checked, the foreign investors in Safaricom were only 7 or 8%. Now, that indicates that this downturn has been pushed by a lot of supply of shares, not because Safaricom has become less profitable, not because Safaricom is not one of the best companies in Kenya, not because that company. And this is the case for several other companies whose share prices have gone down. So if I'm holding those shares and my share price is going down, I have two options. One, if I see the foreigners or whatever is going to cause it to happen, remember COVID, same thing happened. If I see that something is happening that is going to cause the share price to go down significantly, then I should have sold when before it went down and then probably then moved my money to a, a safer haven. Unfortunately, a lot of us didn't do that. So now I'm sitting on say a share that was 40 bob and now it is 20 bob. Now, of course, it's the most difficult time for me to come and tell you to buy more, but it makes a lot of sense to say, since this company is still very profitable, since it is still doing very well, and the only reason the share price has gone down is not because of the company itself or its profits, but because of an external factor, then I buy more shares at, of this, at the lower price which means the ones I bought at 40 bob, if I consistently buy at a very low price, may come down to something like, um, I'll give you an example of, uh, say, I'll use Safaricom, which came from around 44 shillings down to around 13 shillings. So I can bring that 44 shilling price down to something like 25, which means when all these issues end, let's assume these wars end and life comes back to normal, inflation, wheat prices, fuel prices, etc have come back to what we were used to before the wars and COVID, then what is going to happen? The same thing that happened after COVID, these shares will jump. And when they jump, then I will get back into profit earlier. That is called dollar averaging, but in Kenya it is shilling averaging. So basically I am averaging down my price so that I can be able to, to at least position myself for profit. Um, the other thing is to also look at your portfolio and think, wait a minute, I have certain companies which are no longer profitable, are not doing very well. Um, maybe they have come out of um, what they're doing is even old fashioned, maybe. And that's why these companies are going, their share prices have gone down, which means fundamentally the company has a problem. Now, normally it had to sell this because you're in loss and buy another one. But now you're thinking, why don't I sell these ones, which we call toxic stocks? Why don't I sell these ones? and use the same money to buy these ones which are down but are strong fundamentally, because if the market turns tomorrow, these ones will stay down, but these ones which are very good fundamentally will jump. So again, that's another strategy. We call it portfolio restructuring. The third option, of course, is you're not in the market yet. I think this is the best time in my entire career to be getting into 
the Nairobi Securities Exchange. We are looking at companies uh, that were in the 50s, sitting in the 20s. Um, they are fundamentally sound. They are doing very well. They have. Uh, they are even expanding into new markets in in East Africa and. They're growing, which means this is actually a very good time to, to buy. I think uh, I will quote Warren Buffett here, that most people get interested in stocks when everybody else is. The time to get interested is when no one else is. You can't buy what is popular and get rich. That's Warren Buffett for you. And I think it sums up my whole story. Thank you, Linda. Wow. Well, um, thank you. Thank you, Gishu. <laughs> Uh, yes, very interesting. You know, sometimes you get to tell people, trying to get them to understand. That. You call it shilling averaging, yeah. Because yes. you know, we, we say it as we as it is in our market. Um, but then both you and Mary mentioned something uh, in terms of like sentiments and all that. And maybe now I, I just ask Mary, you know, uh, especially when you're in a bear market, you're looking at these prices. Uh, it's quite depressing. Everyone you are talking to is like, where is Okoyetu? You know, where is this our market heading to? And if, so, how do you deal with um, that market sentiment um, as as an investor or as a new investor? Uh, because some of you know it provides some psychological challenges here. Um, just to try and help us out as investors, how do we? How are you able to navigate through um, such um, sentiments? to help us to make informed decisions when you're investing, even during such conditions. Thank you, Linda. So, um, you know, the, the most interesting thing about investors is they tend to be, okay, we, we, we tend to have some investors who are very emotional. So you have the, the hard mentality uh, um, we are heading towards this direction, and I know you've seen this in the market where you're seeing uh, everybody saying we buy Safaricom, and everybody rushes there emotionally. We buy Safaricom. Everybody is saying we sell off this security because I don't know who who has been appointed the director, and we don't like them, so we rush there. We make emotional decisions, <clears throat> and 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 you realize that is not. Um, it, it 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 is not a a, a good um, I'd say it's not a, a good strategy for investing. So how do you then navigate um, these emotional barriers when it comes to investing? You have to have a very good laid out plan. Um, why am I investing? Um, because you you know you you different people have different reasons why they are investing. Uh, for me, I would say. I am just in getting into the market to take advantage of the prices and then I exit. Another person will say, I am, you know, I'm a risk averse person. So I will, you know, I will invest in this certain security because I have looked at the performance of that uh, company and I am confident. So navigating through uh, the emotional barriers and the market sentiments when uh, the markets are, 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 are in a downward turn, you have to go through your analysis, research analysis. Uh, look at the company that you want to invest in. Uh, in as much as um, there is a panic sell, why is everybody selling? I have seen um, uh, something from Warren Buffett where, when, where he said, when everybody is selling, you should be buying. And when everybody is buying, look at it and wonder, why, why can't I buy right now? So you, you because you're not moving with the market sentiment, you're not moving with your emotion. One, you have looked at your portfolio and the reason why I am investing. Uh, put your investment goals into perspective. I am investing in this company because I have looked at the research analysis. I have seen this is a good performing company. I have looked at their earnings per share. It has been doing well over the years, and despite the fact that right now the market is 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 uh, on a downward trend, I know in the future that this is going to improve. So you're making an informed decision when you're making your investment. Now, you you can also diversify, um, because if if um, there are different sentiments about different sectors, just you know about a specific sector. 
diversify your portfolio so that then um, you have looked at the different sectors and you know you you don't put your all your eggs in one basket because you, you know if 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 this sector is not performing well if something happens in the the, the today the government uh, comes up with um, um, a decision that from today we are regulating all you know all 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 dairy farmers and if there is any sector in agriculture that is going to be affected because of that decision you know you're you're making informed decisions and uh, decisions when you're investing it's not an emotional thing you're not following the the hard community and all that so if you come to us as stock brokers we're able to advise you um this is how the market is looking like these are the this this is these are the analysis that we have looked at. This is the situation of the economy. This is the you know the the rates where where they are heading, and you're able to be advised on how to make an informed decision because you'll go to one stockbroker and they'll give you an informed you know analysis. And when you talk maybe to other uh, investors in the market, maybe who are not keen on looking at research and and who have not laid down their investment goals and their investment strategies. Then you, you you will hear them. Their investment decisions are very very emotional. So to distinguish yourself and to make sure that you're not affected by the negative psychological reasoning in the market, make sure that you list down your goals. Make sure that you talk to the right people. Make sure that you look at what is happening in the market. You are an informed investor. You don't wake up and I text you today. Let's buy Safaricom and you don't ask me why. If I say let's jump, you jump and you're not asking me why. So when you're getting into a position, you make sure that you are getting into an informed decision as an investor and you're not relying on emotions of other people or even your own emotions to make a decision. Thank you, Linda. Wow, thank you, Mary. And yes, I agree with you on, on all that you said. And I'll tell you, me from my experience as an investor, um, usually you get the research report sent by your brokers and part of um, the research report will be, you know, they'll give you recommendations. They say for this stock, buy this stock, hold this stock, sell. And they would give you reasons for that. So if you make your investment decisions on that, and uh, for me, I, I find it very useful when you actually note down. So if I'm going to buy, why am I buying this stock? Um, because I've gotten this research and this is what they've told me about the company and I've seen it for myself and um, I'm, I've also looked at the projections and I'm happy with the fundamentals and the, the, the growth potential of this company. So when you have it down somewhere, so later on, you know, when someone comes to you and tell you, oh, no, 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 you know, let's do this. For you, you know, you have a base uh, um, for it. And I think another thing as well for me, I find um, quite useful, is especially for new investors, when you're coming in, um, I, I don't know if it has a name, but for me, I look at it as like gradual investing, where I come in and if the prices are declining, I will start. So long as I've done uh, my research, I've gotten, I'm, I'm happy with the stocks that I want to buy. So I'll start buying them slowly so that in case I buy and the price goes down slightly, then I, I don't think of it like now I'm starting to be in the red, but I'm thinking, oh, this is an opportunity for me to also, the way you should say, you know, um, shilling down. Uh, so I can average down and, and, and do that. So when you're able to do that, um, it really helps. And I think the other one for me as well, I think it was also one of the questions, like, so then how, because for us now at ShareHub, we, we try to also promote and see uh, one of the ways, one of the strategies you can use to deal with this, um, to get to understand the bear market is even just track the simulated gains. Because like now for stocks to gain, uh, which is based on companies that are actually listed on exchange. Um, so you have real companies, um, you know, affected by real um, market conditions. So they are affected by the bear market. You can see the price is declining. So you're able to now test out investment strategies in a simulated environment. So you know, you have your Safaricoms, you have your KCBs. Uh, you have your answers and you're able now to, to try out investment strategies in a safe environment. And through this, now you're able to understand also if, you know, if I try this strategy now and I invest in the real market, it helps out. So it also is good to try out, um, you know, simulated games. Um, for me, I, I do a lot on sports kits and then now I replicate that uh, with the, the real stock market, market investing. 
And then maybe just to finish off, uh, this is to be sure. If, um, are there any industries or sectors that despite the downturn, despite uh, the bear markets, they are quite um, resilient? And um, what factors drive um, their success even during such market conditions? Uh, thank you, Linda. Um, um, and before I answer that, maybe I'll delve into a bit of what you guys were talking about. Um, just so that, um, just to sort of add, um, it's very important, and I would like to post this to anyone watching this. Do you know your risk profile? Because if you don't know your risk profile, then you don't know what how you will react. I tell people, my job is to sell hope. Um, I told that to my boss the other day, actually. I, I sell hope because um, people, for example, right now, 80% of the portfolios are way down there and they're in loss, and we're still talking about investment. Now, if you came and bought something that was, say, and this goes into what you've asked me um, about um, um, are there sectors or certain areas that you'd be looking at, um, see, different stocks have different characteristics, just like different people have different risk profiles. Some people are able to take high risks. There's a guy who loses a container somewhere you know, at sea, and you'll be with him here laughing and enjoying yourself, and you will not notice. There's another guy who loses one shilling. Shilling Gimoja too. That house has to be turned upside down to find that one shilling. And that's because we handle risk, we handle losses differently. So which means, even as we're advising you as stockbrokers, we are looking at how does this person handle risk? How old are they? What would happen if they lost money now? Do they have time to recover? And that informs us because there are different stocks with different characteristics. There are certain stocks, for example, which we call speculative. Now, if you walk in here and tell me, I mean, after pesa haraka, yani naeka leo na uza kesho na kas kumbili na ununua na nunu, you know, uh, for me, you're being speculative. That's extremely risky, and nobody can tell. I'm not a prophet. I can't tell what will go up tomorrow, um, because that is uh, that is what do you call it? Uh, a divine that is that takes divine instinct so basically um, i will tell you to go get a dart board write the companies on that dart board throw a few darts that is speculative investing some people are very good they wake up and say some people will tell you on mondays markets move up on tuesdays i don't know it goes down on friday people are selling you to do what at the end of the month they, they sell or towards a certain month that's speculative behavior because you're buying shares based on your own perceived notions, not fundamentals. Um, and that every company has a level of volatility up and down. So some people are very good at it, um, and but I would be more comfortable if they're doing it with currency trading, but generally that is speculative trading. But then again, we have what we call values, value investing, value stocks, where you look for stocks or companies which are undervalued. They are very good companies. They are making very good profits. And I think this is what I was talking about earlier. They are very stable, but they have lost significantly, which means they are undervalued in the market. And based on your, your when you look at their price to earnings ratios and all that, you see that this company is undervalued. Then you buy it, that's value investing, and you're expecting that you may get a bit of dividends, but also those share prices or those companies can grow significantly in price when markets stabilize. Then we also have those ones we call um, we call growth stocks. Now, growth stocks are different from the value investments because the growth ones will tend to be have a growth trajectory. Now, remember, they may be in the same sector, and I'll give you a good example within the banking sector. You're going to see the old traditional banks, which were here from colonial times, which have been here. They grew to a level where they were they actually even stagnated because they got very big. They had market share, etc. Um, so they're very good dividend payers because they are mature. We call them defensive. They are mature. They have reached that point. They pay good dividends. They don't really grow. They don't really shrink. But they have these clients who are very, very, very loyal to them. Then we have these banks that appeared at some point and started lending, you know, to the people the traditional banks did not lend to. And now they have grown significantly and they're probably even expanding to other countries, which means the chances are because they are growing, they may pay you very little in dividends, 
but their their profits are growing significantly so people in the market want them which creates demand and you find their share prices growing significantly the reason they won't pay you much in dividends is because they're spending that money to say open new branches etc so then we have the kind of companies which as I said, are defensive, very good dividend pairs. So based on your risk profile, somebody who doesn't like risk very much, then we would be looking at those companies, probably two different companies within one sector, which we would say this one is defensive. The share price will hold, even in bad times like this, you'll find their share price is still quite strong. It hasn't gone down as much. Maybe some of the ones in that sector have gone down by 30%, but this one has only gone down by like 5 10% and they are still paying very good dividends. Um, then somebody else who is looking for a little more risk, and remember we have something called the risk return trade-off. So the idea here is that without discussing particular stocks at this point in time, um, we need to look within each sector which stocks give me certain qualities which match with my risk profile. So the first thing that you need to do, and we do this for free, reach out to us. I'm sure Linda is going to give you our contacts. We will do a risk profile, and then based on that, we are able to tell you where, where this one called CG what you should not be buying it because it will cause you stress, and you are not the kind of person who takes the stress well. The other one, we see this is an old guy; he's retiring. I don't think he wants to be taking taking a risk on money that he needs for his maybe even medical expenses down down the line. So we look for something that gives him a sort of pension in terms of dividends. So I think. Um, we do have some sectors that um, do very well, the banking sector, telecoms as well. Um, the investment sector will always be affected by external factors. If the economy is doing badly, it will go down. And that will also affect the insurance sector because they also invest quite a bit. Um, I'm also assuming if they do medical insurance, people are more stressed when the, the economy is bad, so they'll be paying out more anyway. Um, if you look at, say, the agricultural sector, it will tend to be very defensive. Um, most of those companies do tea farming, and so they'll give you very good dividends because they also receive huge bonuses. Um, if you're looking at the manufacturing sector, again, it is very tied to the economy. If things are bad, then chances are manufacturing is not doing very well because then people have, I mean, interest rate and um, inflation is high. Um, salaries have been taxed. So there's less money for us to buy. So manufacturers, manufacturers and probably even the cement um, and construction, the construction sector will probably suffer because people are buying less houses or they are constructing less because things are economically difficult. So again, when you look at different sectors, you also need to look at where is the economy because as I said earlier, the market is the pulse of the economy. So if the market is doing badly, then it means that certain areas in the economy which are doing badly will be very visible. Service sector, again, services sector will also suffer a lot. And this is where you see the supermarkets. This is where you see um, probably even the airlines. And uh, I'm sure people are flying less. Um, COVID hit airlines very difficult. Hospitality companies will also not be doing very well because of less traveling, less spend, which means then you want to be staying away from them during a time like this and coming back into them during a time when you start seeing the economy growing, then you buy them early because then as the economy starts to recover, then they will also recover. Thank you, Linda. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Gishui, for those uh, those insights. And yeah, so as we come um, to the end of the panel discussion, there have been a few questions um, that have been so I think I'll just look through at some and then now we can start answering the questions. Um, I think the first one, uh, allow me to direct this to Mary. We have one of our attendees, um, Deodatus, he's asking, can a person from outside Kenya buy shares from the companies um, listed in the Nairobi Securities Exchange and uh, what should he or she do to be able to buy those shares? Mary? Yes, so thanks to technology, um, you can be able to buy shares from wherever you are. Um, most of the stockbrokers have apps 
uh, which you can download. You can be able to open an account. You can be able to set yourself up. Um, uh, like you he has said, Linda will give contact, our contacts. Uh, you can reach out to us. We can help you to set up an account and be able to invest in the in the in the stock market. Uh, good. I think he was. They were trying just to confirm. I don't have to come personally to to the broker to be able to open. So thank you. Uh, I think Mary has uh, clarified that. Um, and yes, we will share the contact so that at least then you can be able to start that process. Um, this one is from an anonymous. Um, let me direct you to Gishwi. Um, so what are the key parameters in a company that one should consider? before investing, considering the volatility of our stock market right now? I, I think um, sometimes uh, you, you need to look at where the company is going. And that's why financial reports are very important. Um, the reason you're looking at that is because strategically, um, if, if things are becoming digital, and a company is still doing things in a non-digital way, chances are they're not going anywhere in the next few years. And you'll find maybe they have a competitor that is going very digital, and so they will probably five, six years ahead be attracting a lot. Um, so again, the relevance of what a company is doing, <clears throat> and that will normally come out in the strategic part of the financial reports, which is where they're talking about you know, what the strategic vision or direction of that company but again sometimes the company is also already doing very well and so you're looking at what is the company doing of course looking at their profitability looking at how they're managing their cash flows within the company uh, looking at uh, for example their their risk mitigation i mean you can look at things like um, if, if a company is an airline, are they hedging because of fuel prices and stuff like that? Uh, so you need to go a little deeper into what a company is really doing, um, understand what the direction is. I know there are some people who follow the rules of thumb. They're looking at the price to earnings ratio, um, you know, book value, price to book value. But that is dependent. Of course, if I'm dealing with an investment company, then I would be looking at the, the level of invest, you know, the... I'd, I'd be looking at their assets under management, but also the quality of those assets under management. Um, but again, they become a bit difficult also to value because then again, um, some of them are doing so many different investments. So um, I think one of the areas that will really help you is relying on the research reports that come out of most of these brokerage houses. The reason is they also look at things like the net present value of growth opportunities because they have access to the directors of companies. They spend money, we spend a lot of money to make sure that we are getting information, not just from newspapers and financial uh, reports, but also from the people within the company, um, the chief investment officers, the CEOs, try to go for those briefs so that we can come and now deliver that information and say, uh, company A is doing project X in Ethiopia. Um, how is that project going? what is the future of that project how is it going to affect if they have spent a lot of money on it are they going to get real profits from it over a period of time so again um i don't want to drive you towards rules of thumb because um there's no one way of valuing um a company secondly remember markets are affected a lot by external factors uh, you had maybe talking about sentiments so even sentiment is something that would be very important in judging um, how a company goes. Today, we are in a world where Gen Z is the new investor. They care about environmental issues. So they might decide they're not investing in a company just because they use coal or oil. So again, that's a sentiment that you cannot really measure using a parameter like a price to book value or, you know. So again, you need to be a bit more holistic and you need to have your ear out again to what is happening externally, emotionally, psychologically but then you add the fundamentals that we are giving you and trying to digest for you so that you can make important decisions. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, thank you, Gishui. Um, that's quite well explained. Um, so we have a question from Festus Kimutai and uh, he asks how do beginners understand the stock market? Um, I think, let me take this one. Uh, 
that because I, I think investing for a very long time has been viewed as something very complex. And um, as you know, as I said when I was giving uh, the history of how share had came about, it's um, simplifying um, investing, and that's what um, share Hub does. And so, if you're looking to start investing in the stock market and you want to understand um, where to start and how to start, um, I think um, Kimutai, I think I would recommend first you start by looking through. We've shared quite a lot, as I said through my presentation. We have done webinars before. Uh, where we did an introduction to the stock market, just simplifying it for you in terms of the terminologies that you come across as you're investing and how to go about that. Um, so do check our um, social media, um, all on Instagram, on Facebook. And on these ones, we actually even share just short videos trying to explain the terminologies in simplified ways. Um, you can watch the previous webinars where we've now gone through the steps uh, to enable new investors start investing in the stock market. And um, at the end of this, I'll also share um, contacts. You can reach out to the share team to assist you. I'll share the contacts for the brokers so that you know when you feel not confident and you want to start investing, um, you can contact either of them or the licensed brokers, whichever your preference is to take you through. But as I said, so first, just have a look through um, our webinars on our YouTube channel, Share Hub Kenya, uh, through what we have shared on our social media handles as well, on Instagram, on Facebook, and um, on um, on our website as well. There's a lot of information on um, on um, the listed companies um, and all that. Then now we are, we'll be able to assist you um, going forward. And let me address this to to. This next question to Mary, because I have someone, uh, Jose is asking, how does someone open a CDS account? Who maintains it? And are there any maintenance fee to operate the account? Thank you, Linda. Um, I think someone had uh, covered this, but maybe I can just uh, take uh, him through. So to open a, a, a CDS account, you go through a broker, stroke an investment bank, uh, so you'd be able to see uh, the different stock brokers. Uh, you, once you reach out to us, we different brokers um, and institutions, they have uh, different uh, KYC. KYC is know your client. So we'll ask for a passport photo. We'll ask for your ID. We'll ask for your uh, KRA pin. So you, you'll be taken through what you need to provide. But those are the basic and maybe probably a utility bill. Um, then you open your you ask uh, uh, your static data, you know, uh, your date of birth, you give your email address, your contact, next of kin. There's a form that you're given to fill uh, so that you can open a CDS account. Who maintains this CDS account? So we have the stock brokers. Uh, this, they facilitate the buying and the selling and the opening of the, the CDS account. Then we have CDSC, who is it's a different independent institution that holds these shares when you buy them, but through a broker. Actually, as brokers, we are agents of CDSC, where your CDS account sits. So, but you only, you, you access it through us. And if you buy uh, shares through us, we give you a statement. You can also walk into CDSC. CDSC and ask for your statement through the various stock brokers. I don't. I think I've. Uh, I, I hope I've covered that well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you have. Um, thank you, Mary. Um, Samuel. Um, Ian uh, has a question. He says uh, Samuel had talked about portfolio restructuring. What about those securities that are not just sellable? For example, you know, you have. Um, he gives an example of Scan Group. Which are not easily bought. So, what what do you do? You know, he's he's saying, do you die with the with the counter? Yeah, I guess. Um, well, I don't know if Scan Group is totally as okay. Of course, if a company is suspended or off the market, I think we have their three or minings, etc. Then you might not be able to sell the share. You're stuck with it. Unfortunately, one of the things you um, the risks of buying shares is that the shareholder is the last to be paid. So when the venture company goes down, or in the event uh, anything is wrong with that share, you are the owner of that share. It is just like your shop. If you know, at the end of the day, the risk is yours. And so, and in the pecking order, debt is paid first. You know, all that, all those other things are paid 
because the shareholder is the owner. And so, yeah, there are positions where you, you know, um, end up having a toxic, what I call toxic stocks, and it's not even sellable or the price is very low. Now, I think this also comes from one of the biggest problems um, that we have. I've always told people, never buy something that you are not willing. You don't know what you're willing to sell it at. Because what happens is we buy into some of these stocks and then we get emotional attachment to them. And then they start declining and we start insisting on the emotional attachment, uh, sometimes even averaging down and not accepting that you understand. So I think um, I, would, I would quote the Godfather, it's not personal, it's business. And so um, when you're investing, it's business. So if the business is not doing well, um, don't go down with it. So you need to make decisions very early. When you're buying the share, make a decision. If this share goes down by a certain percentage, ask why is it going down by this percentage? Especially if it is going down, it's a bull market and this share is going down. I mean, remember, Mary said a, bull market, a bear market is when all of them are going down. Our majority of shares are going down. But a lot of these shares you're looking at and talking about, even when the market was doing very well, they were still going down, which means there was something fundamentally wrong with either their business or what they were doing. So when I bought that share, I'd say 20 bob, and it went down to 15 bob. I should have been asking and sitting down with my broker when I do my portfolio review, because you should do portfolio reviews with your broker every once in a while, make it quarterly. Some of my clients, we meet in person every quarter to just discuss what's going on, what should we do? What do you think is going to happen? Um, and as I said, we are not prophets, but sometimes this helps us. But what you need to be doing is to go and say, okay, it's gone down by 15%. Why? If you find that whatever is causing it to go down is a fundamental issue, is people selling it. A lot of sometimes you can even see all other shareholders are selling it. So there's a lot of supply. I've seen someone asking when everyone is selling shares, who buys them? This is contrarious. There are those who buy speculatively. So there's always somebody who sees the other side of the coin. But generally, if it has gone back down by 25%, the rest of the market is doing well. I need to look at why and see there's something wrong. There must be something wrong with this company. And then take remedial action. Decide that that's my stop loss. If I lose 25% and it's not adding up, I would rather sell that company and look for the ones that are more likely to go up because they are, they are there. It's, 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 it's a really tough decision to make. But again, a lot of the time, you will come and realize it was the right decision in the long. Thank you, Linda. Thanks, Kisho. And I think that ties to a question I'd seen from uh, Mudiani, uh, and he was asking, so does this mean that a stockbroker is always uh, willing and is mandated to notify the investors of changes in uh, in stocks, or is it also the responsibility of the investor to do their their own research? And I think um, Gishoi has has touched on that, where yes, you know, um, you can have your periodic um, sessions with your broker to look at your portfolio and see how you know you can optimize it. But then you, yourself as an investor as well, um, you also need to do those periodic. Um, investment dates where you look at your portfolio and see is it where you wanted it to be and if it's not what is happening um, you know so that now when you have those sessions with your with your broker you're able also to share your sentiments and why you think this is um, the move so um, and that's why it's very important to have a good relationship with your with your broker um, in case of anything and you need any clarification you are always able to reach out to them and um, they can be able to give you the information that you need before you make um, any investment um, decision. Then, um, so this question, I think I'll just, uh, this one, I'll, I'll uh, open it up to both um, Mary and Gishoi. We have an anonymous attendee asking, um, oh, where is it? Oh, what plans are in place? for brokers to ensure that they onboard more Kenyans to the market to prevent foreign investor influence. I think uh, Gishoi had touched on um, the foreign investor uh, flight and what it, the effect it's having on our market now. So what, what are brokers doing to make sure that CC, uh, when you know, the Kenyans, we are enticed, we are encouraged to, to start investing and supporting our own capital markets. Um, thank you, Linda. So um, 
the different players in the market have actually realized there is quite a gap. So we have your team, ShareHub. Uh, we have the NSC also. We have uh, CASIB also. We have the Capital Markets Authority. And when you look at all of them, they've been trying to do, there has been an increased run of investor education, forums like this where we are advising people. You know, you would think that everybody knows why a broker exists, but you see, you know, there, there are so many investors who don't even know who the different market players in the market are. And when you look at the forum, in markets, they are very well knowledgeable for them who invest in the stock market. By the time they're coming to invest in your market, they have learned about their market, they understand their market, and now are coming to take opportunities in your market because they have realized there are opportunities in your market. So what have we been trying to do? We're trying to make sure that we reach out to as many clients as possible, uh, help them to understand how do you start investing? How do you open a CDS account? What are the different asset classes that you can invest in? Uh, how do you check your risk appetite? Uh, the brokers are able to help you to determine that. Uh, you've seen even um, NSC in conjunction with uh, CASIB have um, launched the, this Dosika application where you're able also to have a lot of information in the market. So there has been uh, different um, initiatives by the different players in the market to try to get as many Kenyans as possible to learn investing in the stock market. We've also seen there are competitions for students so that students can also understand once you finish school, how once you start having uh, an, uh, an income, how do you start investing for your future and the different asset classes that you can invest in. There are the risk uh, or rather the, the risk uh, those who can take up uh, can be able to to digest risk, there are those uh, securities that you can invest in. We also have fixed income securities where um, the people who are risk averse and you want a fixed income, you can invest in. So there have been initiatives and you can reach out to the different brokers and you are now able to learn about us today because Linda and her team at ShareHub have initiated this forum so that we can get Kenyans to be able to understand our stock market. Thank you. Dishoy? Um, yeah, I think um, Mary has done quite a good job. I mean, um, she's given us... But I think one of the things that uh, we are looking at is that uh, there is an underlying demographic factor that affect, is affecting our markets. You see, um, today, um, our younger generation has access to a myriad of even digital, you know, um, investment options. And so um, I think the cool factor is uh, what we are really trying to bring back to markets because at the end of the day, um, the way our younger generation, I mean, I'm talking from experience, my client base, if I look at it cl closer, I usually find that uh, most people tend to start thinking of investment when they have to. Um, and so, and you find, because during the years of the Kibaki rain shares were very popular. Then a lot of the older generation, you know, between 45 and above, will tend to be the ones that are more invested in the market than the younger generation. But then look at what the competition to investing in shares and bonds is. We've got cryptocurrency, we've got there's you know, so many other things. And these ones have that instant gratification, which um unfortunately people end up losing a lot of money because they're following stories of one or two guys who made a lot and the, the hard effect happens because everyone is running to be like that one or two guys without realizing 90% of the guys who did that exact same thing lost all their money. So I think um, it's how we package um, this, uh, this, this education, which is now we are coming to you digitally. We are doing things like the investment challenge that Mary mentioned where university students can get on and do simulations so that they understand the market. Linda mentioned that kind of thing. We're also doing a lot of um, trainings. If you have um, investment groups and chamas and a group of friends that you can get together and you meet on a certain day, we are very happy to come and sit down with you and have a discussion around your chamas investment plans and your personal investment plans. 
Um, so these are things that we're doing so that we're able to reach as many people. Um, but one other thing that we have found, unfortunately, happens in Kenya and causes foreign investors to have a big advantage is that um, if you go and look at, say, someone like South Africa, you will find that only about 10 to 20 percent of all invest investors in their markets are individual CDSC, for lack of a better word, CDSC accounts. Now in Kenya, out of the 1 million or so CDSC accounts, only like 5% is institutional, which means people pulling funds. So a lot of us walk into the market with 5,000, 2,000 shillings, uh, which we cannot actually um, diversify with because it's not much money. Um, so it means that it would make a lot of more sense if you younger generation are coming to us in groups our investment groups, because that gives you more investing power. That gives you an ability to pull more funds and be able to diversify your risk, which again is a very good way to come to the market. So I've started educating you already, but um, all I'm saying is we are looking at different ways um, of just sensitizing people. And I think uh, Mary mentioned um, the different avenues and the different platforms. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gisho. I agree with both you and Mary. And um, and I think as well, it's also to note that it's not that we lack, uh, if we look at the CMA reports most of the time and we think, and we look at the inactive um, CDS accounts that we have, it's quite a, no, it's quite a number. And it's just about, um, for us who are here, so if you're on this webinar and you've seen, you're starting your investment journey, but you know someone who had already opened a CDS account, but because, you know, maybe then, um, you know, there were the barriers that we had talked about the know-how, the information, and now we've said there is this information, the brokers are giving you information um, and all that, they're willing to sit and talk to you. It's also now to, to spread the word to the people out there and let them know, don't let your, your dormant account just sit as it is. Um, start your investment process. It doesn't have to be with a lot of money. Um, you know, you have the option of coming and starting to invest with the little that you have. You have the option of coming together um, as a group um, to your chama pool your funds and then you're able to invest as well and um, I think in addition now from us as as share hub we are really um, on that the financial interest aspect especially for the young generation so that as they start working and, and earning you've already you have set that foundation where you understand um, these are the benefits of investing and starting to invest young and you're able to now pull, put that in into your 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 budget so you know this is my money this is my income these are my expenses this is the money that i'm setting aside to to invest and these are the investment options um that are, are out there so i think it's not just to the brokers but i think it's a challenge to all of us as well um as you know kenyans out here uh, to support our market whether you're in the diaspora maybe has said you can be able to open an account and start investing and, and supporting the Kenyan market. If you're local here, and um, Shoei has talked about the digitalization uh, of, of um, the process of opening and run, run, you know, uh, running your investment journey is quite easy, is up uh, at least now. So then, you know, um, we can be able to, to do that. Um, well, uh, let me see. So I think that was also in response to, I think Anne had said, this is really great and enlightening. I'm a university student and I've really gotten informed and I think university students should be enlightened about this. So please share. As I said at ShareHub, we're doing a lot of um, financial literacy trainings at universities. We'd be very happy to, to come and have sessions and talk to even more because we also understand not all um, students undertake finance and investment courses. So it would be good to be able to provide um, the financial literacy skills to, um, to uh, all students irrespective of whether they are in the field of finance or not. Um, Jezreel is asking, and I think I've seen another question as well that is related to that. Can you invest in the stock market using different stock brokers? Or is it that once you commit to one, you have to stick with them? Um, and yeah, there's also a question asking um, about the changing of, uh, of brokers. If you're able to do that, can you enlighten the process of changing of brokers? Or was also a question from an, an anonymous attendee. And what is the process? Um, if you're able to change brokers as you're investing. I can take that. 
Yes, Mel. Thank you, Mel. Yes, so um, you can invest through different brokers. Uh, once you open a CDS account uh, with one broker, you invest through them. But if you go to a different broker using the same identification, say you're using your ID to open a CDS account, if you've opened a CDS account at Sterling Capital and you go to Samuel with your ID to open a CDS account, when he goes to open for you, he will see that account, that, that CDS, that ID already exists under, but he won't be able to see with which stock broker, but he's able to register it. The CDS number will not change. It will be the same. So you will be registered under Sterling Capital and you'll also be registered under NCBA. Now for the stocks that you buy through Sterling Capital, you're only able to sell through Sterling Capital. For the stocks that you buy through NCBA uh, Investment Bank, you're only able to sell through NCBA Investment Bank. So yes, you can have uh, different brokers with the same identification. Um, uh, for you to move uh, shares from one broker to another, you have to go to that broker where the shares exist. There are some forms that you will be given to fill in. Uh, once they are filled in, you go to the stock broker where you're taking those uh, shares to. Remember, you will not be registering or opening a new CDS account. It's just transferring of th these shares from here to there. So if you don't have a CDS or rather an, an investing account with that stock broker, they will register that CDS account and you go with that form that was filled by the previous stock broker and you bring it there. There is a fee that you have to pay CDSC. Um, that fee is paid directly to CDSC. Uh, then the, the broker where you're taking your shares will process the forms and take them to CDSC and the transfer is effective. It's just a matter of a few days, uh, probably two or three days. So yes, it is possible to move shares from one broker to another. And yes, it is possible to invest through uh, different stock brokers. You don't have to be stuck uh, to one stock broker. Uh, thank you. Mary. A question just came to mind. Is, uh, is there a limit to the number of uh, CDS accounts you can open the different brokers? Like if they go to five different brokers, can I open, can I have like five different, okay, maybe the same CDS number, but with five different accounts with uh, the respective brokers? Or is it limited no. to maybe just two or three? <laughs> no, there is no limit. You'll find some investors even have a CDS account with almost all the brokers. <laughs> There's no limit. But, you know, as we say, you know, you have a relationship with your stockbroker and, you know, the, the, the way you work with them, the confidence that you have with them. At some point, you will choose who you want to to have the relationship with. And maybe I can just mention here um, for those who are afraid of, of doing where do I start to invest and all that. Some of these stockbrokers have uh portfolio managers uh, and these portfolio managers are the ones who work with you in the investing journey and you can walk into the office sit with a portfolio manager and they're able to guide you through so these are services that are available with the stockbroker so i don't know why you would want to have maybe several maybe to diversify but anyway and it is up to the yes <laughs> Yeah, but if you think of it eh, from an investor perspective, you, you are spreading yourself too thin eh? if you open yeah. and you are trying to buy. So then that means you'll be buying 100, 200 shares with this broker. This, um, so you don't really uh, get the value of, of investing when you do that. So yeah, thank you, Mary. You know, um, single out, check them out, go and see, vet them, uh, try and see if, you know um, what they provide fits, what you're looking for. And then you, you start that journey together. So thank you, Mary, for, for that clarification. Um, Gishoi, may, maybe I send this your way. How has the role of stockbrokers changed with the rise of um, apps and you know um, online-based investing? You know, you talked about the digitization where now even as an investor, once I open an account, I'm able to to trade on uh, through the, the uh, what the platform that you, you share with me as an investor. And you, as you are answering that, and then also let us know that do you provide training to get, to take um, new investors, especially through the process of understanding all those numbers going, the reds, the arrows, um, and all market depth, all that. Do you take them through 
to be able to understand now how to use the platform to their benefit? Yes, uh, thank you. I think that's a very good question. And the reason um, <clears throat> this is a very good question is that, um, you see, in the past, if you wanted, and I think it's, it's good to just explain the process. In the past, if you wanted to buy shares, <clears throat> this was, I'll start with certificates. You came with your certificates. You wrote in a book. Of course, there were no computers. Then I took them certificates. I gave a messenger to run to the market with them, where somebody will shout the price, etc., and they will sell and exchange hands. Then it would take maybe another 10, 15 days before a new certificate is printed and brought to my office for you to pick up. So you can imagine if you're an investor and you're in Moranga, or in uh, Kisumu, you had to travel all the way to Nairobi to bring your certificates, meaning even the price of your shares, that's a transaction cost, it's huge. Um, later on, of course, when computers came, what we would do, we'd give you something called email indemnity, which would allow you to send an email and tell us to buy and sell shares for you. Now that would mean that uh, a team like mine, which is a business development team, which has now the portfolio or investment advisors, their job would be to receive that email, place the order in the market. Now, remember, if I have 30 emails and all of them are saying buy a certain share and I'm placing these orders, um, by the time I place your order, maybe it's an hour after I received it and the share price has changed. So again, not very efficient because markets are real time. It's happening and you need that order to get to market as fast as possible. But humans are only limited to a certain amount. Now, um, and that also means that I'm spending more time receiving, reading emails and putting in your orders and following up on the orders to see if they traded or they didn't trade. Now, that means that um, if you walked into my office and you wanted to discuss your shares, chances are I would have been quite distracted because I'm too busy trying to make sure the orders that are already in the market are going to market. Now, today, um, I am doing very little of that because I am sitting here, I, you call, we discuss what you want to buy or sell, we discuss your portfolio, you ask me about the research report I sent yesterday, uh, we agree this is what you need to do with your portfolio, we agree these are the shares you need to buy, what kind of prices we are looking at, because you can see the prices, right? And once we put down the phone, you go and buy the shares, you buy or sell at your own point, which means it has added a lot of value in how much research we do, how much more time we have to look at the market and study it and be able to give you even alerts, maybe on our, on our WhatsApp channel and say, hey, this company has just announced this, we expect ABC to happen. Um, so the digitization has caused markets to be very efficient in how information is shared, in how we we manage your portfolios, that personalization. Because before we would give you a personalized care, but it was personalized care in what? I receive your email and place your order. Now it's personalized care in I call you, you call me, we have time to sit down and discuss the important issues about your portfolio. So that has really changed. Uh, the onboarding process now also, it has given me time to go on a call like this with you, display the online platform on the screen, and then we go through, this is what happens. This is the market depth. This is the, you know, this is this means the price is going down or up. This is where you can create your own uh, your own uh, watch, watch list of those shares you want to watch, et cetera. So again, the quality of services that the broker is giving you has increased exponentially because of the digitization, because then it allows the stock broker to spend a lot of time adding value to your journey than just doing operational issues like placing others. Thank you. Thank you, Kishun. Um, and I think maybe the last question, just to sum it up. Um, so when your shares are pledged, do you still get dividends uh, you know, paid to you as a shareholder? Uh, yes, yes, you do. You still get uh, the dividends paid to you as a shareholder, because they're your shares, you've just pledged them, and you're paying for the loan from whatever you're paying. Uh, but Linda, before we close, there's a question I'm seeing there that I'm really itching to answer. Uh, somebody, because it says my name, says Gishohi, can you, okay, it says Gishohi, can you explain again, you said something like you cannot buy something which is popular and get rich. 
Um, that was a quote from Warren Buffett that um, people get interested when, some, when everybody else is. I'll explain it very briefly. I know time is not on our side, but I'm going to use the quail business to explain this. Now, I remember a few years ago, I walked into a supermarket and I saw some quail eggs and there were 10 shillings per egg. A week or two later, I walked by the same place and there were 100 shillings per egg. There was even a small thing written 100 shillings. And I remember asking the guy at the supermarket because, um, you know, I thought, I thought I think quail eggs look ugly. I thought these little ugly things. Uh, now they are 100. How? So I called a few friends and asked them, what is this quail business? I mean, I work in markets. If a share goes from 10 shillings to 100 shillings, I'm interested. And everybody was surprised. Are you sure you know everything about markets? How come you don't know about quail? So they told me what was happening in the quail business, and now everybody was into quail business. Um, about two, three months later, I'm walking past one of these guys who sell uh, um these sausages in the, the market, they're called smokies. Yeah. And I see quail eggs there. So I tell the guy, dude, hey, we call Jubana. you have quail eggs, you call belly. And uh, the guy told me, yeah, 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 they're five bob. So you can see quail eggs went from 10 bob to 100 bob and back to five bob. That's what we call a market cycle. Now, um, I would imagine that. Most people who got into the quail business, in the market we say buy the rumors, sell the news, got into the market because everybody was saying how big quail business is. The chances are they were getting into the quail business when a quail egg was 100 shillings. If you come to buy a quail from me and a quail egg is 100 shillings, chances are I will sell you the quail very expensive. So your entry into the quail business is high. So when everybody now had quails, somebody asked there, if everybody is selling, who is buying? then it means there were so many eggs that economics tell you that the share price or whatever price of quail eggs went down. Now, eventually, uh, nobody wanted to be in the quail business. Why? You bought the quails for a lot of money to earn 100 per egg. Now, quail eggs are five more. Now, the question I would have for you, do you think that quail business would be a good idea right now? We are sitting here. Well, I don't know what your answer is, but I would say yes. Why? There was already a market. There was people buying quail eggs. Now, when did you last see quail eggs in the market? Meaning there's people who want to eat quail eggs, but there are no quail eggs available because everybody thinks quail eggs business was a pyramid scheme or whatever they say. But if I went and found somebody who still has quail, you couldn't just kill them because you got a license from KYC, K Kenya, those guys of animals. They're called what? Yeah. KWS. So, KWS. So you have quail, but you are giving the eggs to your dogs because you don't want to sell them at five bucks. So chances are this guy will be very happy. Chukua quail, chukua nyumba ya quail, chukua ata chakula enda nayo. So I will get into the quail business for very cheap, which means for me, selling a quail egg will be very, very we, at five bob will be okay. Secondly, I'll be selling to all those guys who are looking for quail eggs who can't find them, so there's a ready market. Have you seen? I'm buying quail eggs when they're very unpopular, but I can do very well because there's a market out there and nobody wants to do the quail business. You who bought the quail egg when everybody was buying the quail, 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 getting into the quail business, loses a lot of money. You can buy what is popular and get rich. Thank you. Ah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that one. And I think I've also noticed this uh, will make it our final, final one. Um, um, I think it's very important because we mentioned opening a CDS account is free, uh, but it's also good to know. Uh, Teresa Ndugu is asking, is there a monthly fee paid to the stockbroker? And I think maybe then uh, I would address it to both um, Gishoi and, and Mary, respectively, at Sterling and at MCBA. Uh, is there a monthly fee that um, as stockbrokers you, you charge for? your clients and then she also asked is there a maintenance fee for the cdsc account uh, because we had said it's free to open but then is there a maintenance fee and if yes how often is it supposed to be paid so i think uh mary first uh, on you know for for sterling uh, what's your your, your take on that one uh, how do you approach it uh, at sterling and then gishoi can take it for ncba Okay, so for Sterling Capital, we don't charge any fee for opening an account and maintaining a CDS account. 
um, for the stockbroker account. We also don't charge any maintenance fee for a CDS account. A CDSE had themselves proposed a maintenance fee, which uh, was suspended. That decision was suspended. So currently for us at Sterling, we don't charge. Um, thank you, Miri. I think you should. Yeah, um, yeah, at NCBA, we don't um, charge for maintaining an account. It is free. Um, and uh, basically, we make our money when you buy or sell shares, um, which is called a brokerage commission. But basically, maintaining an account, opening an account is free. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I think at this juncture, for the questions that um, had been posted and not been answered, we will uh, look at them, we'll answer, we'll get back to you um, individually, but because of time. And uh, we'd also like to give at least one participant a chance to be able to you know, come um, live and ask um, their question. So to be able to do that, we'll deal with the questions which had been asked on the, on the chats um, individually and um, share. So before we give uh, Mary and Gishui a chance to make their final remarks, um, we can take um, one um, from uh, the participants, anyone who'd, who's interested to be able to ask a question um, live, we'll give you this chance to be able to do that. Hi, um, thank you. I think Kevin had uh, raised his hand. He'd like to to be allowed to talk, so I'll just give you access to do that. Um, Karibu, Kevin. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, yeah, let me issue with my microphone. Thank you. Thank you. So my question is, uh, first, I want to thank you first for the this program. It is really beneficial. And I really appreciate. Thank you. Uh, so my question, uh, my question is, uh, are you limited in local markets or uh, you're open even to outside companies like international where I can see maybe there's an opportunity I need to invest in that share. Can I introduce it to my share broker and then uh, they invest on my behalf for international companies? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you, Kevin. I think I can direct that to Samuel maybe. Uh, yes, we do um, at the moment avail the regional markets to you. We have uh, brokers that we work with there, so you can buy shares in Uganda, you can buy shares in Rwanda, you can buy shares in Tanzania. We are currently in discussions with uh, with uh, investors. With we are in, in discussion to start giving our investors access to West African markets. So that is an ongoing discussion, and hopefully soon we can do that. Um, Currently at NCBA, we are not uh, doing anything in Europe or the USA. Um, there are certain things that you have to have in place to be able to do, to give ac investors access to those markets. But that's where we sit at the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mary, maybe from um, Stalin? Yeah, even for us, we have access to the regional markets, Uganda, Tanzania, um, Zimbabwe, um, and Rwanda. Then we also have access to Ghana, Nigeria, um, and we're also participating in the African exchange linkage where we're bringing together uh, the different stock markets and Sterling Capital is a participant in that project. So within Africa, so we, we 
we are we are able to give you access but to specific markets that i have mentioned um internationally we're trying to come up with something where we can give our investors access to the european and the us markets that is in the works also so once we do that you'll be able to see the launch on our on our social media platforms and our website uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kevin, for, for asking that. Um, I think just one last one uh, from Udviani uh, before now we do the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so one question is, uh, like, what are the best resources to get uh, such information about trade one? What to buy uh, aside from <clears throat> the research given by the stock brokers? Yeah, I can take that. Um, there are certain yeah. websites. Um, I think there's uh, things like mystockskenya.com, there is uh, Bloomberg, there's investing.com, um, a lot of which will have something on Kenyan markets. The other place is if you go on company websites, you're able to go onto their investor relations um, sections and in the investor relations sections, you're able to access quite a lot of um, information and uh, financial reports. I believe if you go on this Capital Markets Authority website, there is a place on that website where you can actually access a huge database of historical information. Uh, the Nairobi Securities Exchange as well. Um, they're also a data vendor and they can, you can be able, they have data vendors and you can be able to access data um, if you need to do your own research. Um, and uh, I, I think generally there is, because market information and listed companies are supposed to publish the information. So it's it's available out there. Um, the only difference in say what the broker does is that they actually gather this information and you know crunch it and then also have access to the actual officials within the companies to try and get more in-depth insight um, than maybe somebody doing it on a freelance level would do because they also have uh, you know some backing financially so they're able to actually do it a bit deeper but generally the information is accessible out there it is available and uh, remember, you can also go to the Central Bank of Kenya website if you're dealing with things to do with bonds and uh, treasury bills. Um, you have the statistical, Kenya Statistical Bureau. Um, they also have a lot of statistics that you can use to also make uh, decisions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gishui, for that. And thank you, Mithiani, for, for asking as well. Um, for us at ShareHub as well, I think I mentioned this during the introduction to ShareHub. We are part of our land. Uh, the land pillar is to provide this information. And we have also been able to collate data um, of uh, listed companies, you know, share price movements, um, you know, dividend yields for companies that are listed on the Nairobi Securities Exchange, dating back to 10 years. And you're able to access this. So once you, you download the app, you're able to access the data um, for free for the first three months. And after that, we have subscription packages, um, quite pocket friendly, you know, from a thousand shillings and all. And you're able to get this information to help you now uh, to be able to analyze as you're making your investment decision. So, in addition to all the resource um, areas that Kishoi has mentioned um, on the share of uh, website as well, when you check on the market info, you'll be able to get um, this information. So, and I think, um, let me wrap it up uh, there and just give a chance now to Mary and Gishoi. Thank you so much for, for joining us and for sharing your expertise and your knowledge um, that you've gained through your years in the industry. Um, so I'll give maybe Mary first a chance to give us our final remarks um, as we proceed to wind up the, the webinar. Thank you, Linda. Um, so I think for me, my take, my parting shot would be uh, what I've taken from this webinar. Um, it is important for you as an investor to make an informed decision. 
Um, so you would be able to do that by looking at, you know, do your research well. Uh, for us as stockbrokers, we are, we're giving you this research. You know, it is very easy uh, to read through. It's very easy to understand. You can compare the research reports from different stockbrokers for you to be able to make an informed decision. Uh, you don't feel shy to walk to a stockbroker and ask and just tell them, I don't understand uh, how to invest. I don't understand the stock market. Maybe you can take you, you can take me through. And that is why we are here to help you through your investing journey. So thank you so much, Linda, also for this opportunity to be part of uh, the team that is educating the market. Uh, this is really good. And you will share our contacts so that in case uh, anyone has any further questions, they can reach out to us. Um, and you're much welcome. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, so, Gishoy, over to you for your closing remarks. Yeah, um, as I said earlier, um, uh, information is the key. Um, and so the more you know, the more you understand. Uh, but one other thing that I'd like to say is someone used to tell us when we were young that money does not grow in trees. True, it doesn't, but it grows like a tree. And so um, investment is a journey. Um, it takes time. You learn from your mistakes. You will make losses, but you will also make profits. The idea is to profit more than you're losing. And over time, you will actually get to learn to understand the markets. Um, but if you're not making the decisions based on an informed position, you're more likely to follow your emotions, make losses, and never invest again. But if you do it from a well, um, well planned and a well created base, um, you know, proper risk profile, a proper investment plan, um, you know, and there are chances that you will grow and become a great investor over time. So I, I really commend all of you guys who have joined this and taken time to listen to us. And for the time that we've taken is quite a while, but you've been here and that means you're interested. And the more you learn, the better invested will be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kishoi. And I think for me, it's just first to thank um, Mary and to thank Kishoi for taking time um, to join us. A uh, very big thank you as well to CASIP, uh, Kenya Association of Stockbrokers and Investment Banks, uh, Willie Jorogen, and his team, you know, for you know, heeding to our call to say, let's um, get the brokers, let's get investors out here understanding uh, better how um, the role of stockbrokers and how to be able to, to benefit um, from uh, their stockbrokers. You know, you can only benefit if you understand exactly um, what the role of stockbrokers are. So thank you very much, Mary, for taking time and being with us here, taking us through, sharing the knowledge and your experience. Thank you, Kishoi, um, for doing the same, answering the questions, you know, um, sharing stories that make it relatable for us. And for me, I think, uh, let me just borrow from ShareHub, because uh, ShareHub, we talk a lot about sharing the information. So if you've been here and um, from the beginning of the webinar to the end of the webinar, you've learned uh, two, five, ten things. Please don't keep it to yourself. Share it with those around you. Um, and it's everything, you know, from um, investing, anything to do with pledging, if you know people who have opened accounts and their dormants, you know, um, seek them out, ask them to reactivate their accounts and start trading. Um, share the information and what you have learned today because that's how we get to grow as a society. And that's how we also get to grow our, our capital market. But thank you very much to all our attendees. Um, the ones who've uh, been with us up until now. Um, at this point as well, I want to say thank you to the Share Hub team behind the scenes. Uh, you know, the ones who are sharing all the links that we are talking about. After this, uh, we would share the contacts for, for Mary, for Southern Capital, for Gishoi, for NCBA um, as well, so that even as you transition from the virtual um, games, you've gained the confidence and now you want to start investing, then you're able to um, reach out to them and um, you can be able to now start your, in your investing journey in the real Nairobi Security Exchange uh, with their help. But from all of us here at ShareHub, it's Asante Nisana. Uh, this um, webinar is uh, live on YouTube. We, we are going to have it on our YouTube channel. We will share a few snippets here and there from uh, 
on our social media um, platforms as well. So if you missed or you know someone maybe who wanted to attend and they missed it, uh, let them worry not. Uh, they'll be able to, they can be able to access it. Um, as I said, I'll share our contacts as ShareHub, contacts for NCBA, contacts for, for Sterling so that you can be able to reach and, and ask. We'll try and deal with the questions as well that are there. But as Antony Sana, and um, these webinars, we hold them periodically every month or every other month. And um, so from the feedback that we get from the surveys and the platform, we'll be able to, um, to curate the next one. And we hope, uh, we trust that you will uh, join us for the webinars as well. But as Antony Sana, thank you very so much. Thank you, Mishu, so much. And thank you, everyone, for attending. So allow me to end this webinar. As Antony, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Bye. Thank bye, you. guys. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are all free to leave now. Thank you. <laughs>